This week on the Computer Chronicles, coverage of the European Technology Roundtable Exhibition in Lisbon. We'll show you some hot new hardware and software from several European companies. A Korean firm launches an under $500 PC. Some details on the new design for Internet 2 and a look at the future of the web. Plus predictions on the PC versus the TV and the telephone line versus cable modems. And a look at Java and Genie from the chief scientist at Sun, John Gage. A peek into the computer technology of the future, coming up next on the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by PeopleSoft, a global supplier of enterprise application software for business, education, and government. PeopleSoft, we work in your world. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. We're here in Lisbon, Portugal this week to cover the annual ETRA conference, the European Technology Roundtable and Exhibition. Probably one of the world's most important annual gatherings of computer industry CEOs, analysts, and journalists. In fact, many of the top leaders of the major global technology companies are here talking about the future of the computing industry, taking a look really at what hardware, software, and internet products you and I will get to use in the coming years. From now on, every time Francesco starts his application, just put the finger down and the computer will type the password for him. One of the big issues in this new interconnected networked world is security and how to find a better system than user IDs and passwords to control access to desktops and networks. One innovative company called Digital Persona has come up with a clever solution called URU. This little device can read your fingerprint, record the pattern, and then automatically recognize you and only you the next time you want to gain access to your system. No need for passwords and no need to worry about someone else breaking into your system. The URU device uses a USB port to connect to your computer. It takes about one second for the system to verify your fingerprint and the makers claim it is 99.99% accurate. Another hot topic here at Etra was data mining, especially on the web. You're on a website and you want easy to understand information about who's visiting your website and what they're doing there. Or you have sales data, but you want to slice and dice the information in a way other than the way it was presented to you. Up until now, most such reports involved cumbersome lists of numbers. But a company called Memphis International has come out with an interesting software product called the Survey Explorer that gives an average user the ability to restructure statistical data and get graphic reports that are easy to understand and manipulate. The Gallup Poll Organization is using the software to do online polling with results published on the web. Whether you're a cyber company or a real-world company, you've got to do your homework and your research before launching a new venture or a new product. To meet that need, a company called MBE Simulations showed off its new program called MBE, an acronym for Manage by Experience. The software lets you practice a business decision on a simulator the same way you would practice an airplane landing on a simulator. The point is not to crash in the real world. With MBE, you can look at your business from five different views, overall management, production, procurement, financial, or marketing. The software tracks your cash flow, your profits, and your business reputation. That is how customers are reacting to your decisions. You can experiment with changing prices or reducing cycle times to see what effect those business decisions will have on your bottom line. And you can accelerate the calendar to examine results at any point in the future. Perhaps the most talked about introduction here at Etra was a new $499 PC manufactured by the Korean computer company Trigem. We can't show it to you because it's still under wraps, but this will be the first ever under $500 complete PC. It will include a 266 megahertz CPU, 32 megs of RAM, 2 gig hard drive, 10x CD-ROM drive, 56K modem, and a 15-inch color monitor. TriGem says it will be available in retail stores in the U.S. later this month. The CEO of TriGem, Young Tae Lee, thinks under $500 is the magic price point for turning PCs into everyday household appliances. $500 is a magic number. Uh, when uh, $500 barrier uh, broken down, PC are 
market exploded. And uh, it, gener it generated a uh, new market and also second bias uh, rushed in. Same thing happened to the color TV also. Uh, color TV, when it break $500, uh, the, every American family was affordable. I think the same thing will happen. This will generate a huge market. But not everyone agrees. Alex Vieux, CEO of Dasar, says being able to make a $500 PC in Korea is only half the challenge. I think that Korea is facing a situation uh, and Trigem is facing a situation where they have great manufacturing abilities. Now to know whether they can sell those products and to make them available to millions of people is another story. How will the other people react? How much of an edge will they have? How much of a branding will they have? Here's Trigem, which has been in this industry for 15 to 20 years. Nobody knows of their brand outside of the country. This is a tremendous weakness. Um, and Rule Peeper, formerly of Tandem and Compact, now with Philips, says price is not as important as ease of use and a consumer-friendly design. If the design center is not consumer ease of use, then a hard-to-use PC at $200 doesn't solve the problem of the consumer. So while PC technology comes down as a component or as a peripheral, that makes it interesting and that makes the home more valuable as a network, as a combined set of functions. But I would say it is this price point plus the ambient intelligence, ease of use factors, perfect stability that will actually make the consumer electronics side work. Um, if that wouldn't happen, then I think you will see this periphery of IT technology in the home that maybe not all consumers will use or will want to use. But Trigem is not worried. Young Tae Lee thinks the advent of the $500 PC can raise PC penetration in the United States from the current 40 percent to near 60 percent. In fact, he thinks PCs may become so cheap that some companies will give them away. That's uh, become reality. And uh, because uh, if a PC becomes the lower than $500 uh, for end user price, uh, it, which, which means uh, it is uh, much lower for uh, wholesale price. So, so uh, it could be a giveaway item for uh, telecommunication service providers and also software vendors. Software vendors may put their software and, uh, and uh, give away hardware. This, is, this will bring all different kind of new games. But the view over in Europe is that the so-called information appliance may become more important in the home than the traditional PC, especially if the appliance can have what rural people refer to as ambient intelligence. It's about this notion of, of built-in but, but transient. Ambient is like built-in but transient uh, intelligence of the consumer so that the device does know what that consumer likes to do how they like to do it, where they like to do it, how often they like to do it. Sounds like a, you know, another story. But uh, I really feel that it is much more up to these intelligent devices of the future to make life of the consumer easier. Let's not ask the consumer to learn all these new things. That would be dumb. One incredible Philips experiment in ambient intelligence involved little lapel buttons that had embedded in them an individual's personal profile. The buttons could wirelessly transmit that profile information to any other person wearing the same kind of device. We did produce these buttons that uh, would, it comes out of a larger concept, which is about, uh, you know, how to use clothing or, or, you know, electronics very close to the person that, that would be able to inform others about who you are, uh, what you like, etc. And so one of the ways that, to do that was to to have an electronic signal actually represent you in a forum. And as soon as two, quote, compatibility signals would, would see each other, that would be communicated through a button lighting up. And, you know, it, it apparently was a big hit in the discos where people who had never met before would probably never meet, but now by just, you know, mingling, suddenly <coughs> lights went on and they said, ah, that must be okay. <laughs> The singles bar scene will never be the same. Another scene that appears to be changing in a fundamental way is the underlying architecture for computing. A 
main players are Microsoft and Sun. The main weapons are the new Windows and Sun's Java and its newest idea, Genie. What does Genie do? It changes the foundations of computer organization. Today, if you have a PC, in the PC you have an enormous amount of software, drivers for a hundred printers little pieces of software that make the printers work, drivers for a hundred modems, drivers for a hundred disks, but you only have one modem, one printer, one disk. So you're carrying an enormous amount of unused, wasted, you're paying for this. That's the problem with the PCs, a very bad design, very wasteful, and out of date. The moment it ships, you never have the new driver that you need for the new software. It's the wrong way of thinking about things. It bases it on files that you have with you. With Genie, there is a whole new model for how devices communicate with each other, a network model that is independent of platform or operating system. With the network, when you plug the new disk drive in, the disk drive itself has the software on it that you need to use to make it work, written in Java. The small Genie mechanism takes that software, puts it out onto the network in a way that can be reached by someone wishing to store something. So in a way, the disk drive says, hello, I'm here, I'm happy to store things. And anything that needs storage finds it when it needs it and makes that connection, uses it and releases the connection. I'm a television camera, I make pictures. Does anybody want a picture? Well, I'm a display, I'm ready to display. You touch the camera, touch the display, and what's on the camera appears on the display. I'm a camera. I'm a Palm Pilot. I'd like to see what's on the camera. Touch the camera, touch the Palm Pilot, and what's on the camera appears on the screen of the Palm Pilot. It just works. But despite what seems like a very good idea, Alex Vieux uh, thinks Java, and, uh, Genie, and Sun are in for a hard time, and that Microsoft and Bill Gates and, uh, should not be worried. The reality is that he's not scared about Sun, and Compaq said the same thing at the conference, and Gates is right. Uh, Scott McNally should have nightmares. Uh, Scott McNally and his company's son are facing a very, very, very difficult situation. And if I were uh, a, a son sh uh, shareholder, I would short the stock. I would short the stock immediately. The other big product news here at Etra was Bill Gates' announcement of Office 2000, apparently skipping an Office 98 product for Windows and leaving that version to the Mac. In a speech at the Etra conference, Gates conceded that software and hardware still have a long way to go in the challenge to become user-friendly. Computers today, you will look back on these things as pretty bad. Uh, they don't see, they don't listen, they don't speak, they don't learn. They are cryptic. Uh, and it's a small matter of uh, unbelievable microprocessors and pretty amazing software uh, to eliminate those problems. Uh, and you know, we're an industry that, to some degree, lived off of uh, great work at uh, uh, some of the universities and at Xerox for a long time. And now we're pushing the frontiers. And so the PC industry really is having to do its own research, uh, still benefiting from the universities, but taking that and putting it together. You know, what is the breakthrough in programming? Programming hasn't changed in these last 30 years. Yes, using packaged software is more prevalent. Uh, componentized software really is beginning to be a reality, uh, but uh, no fundamental breakthroughs. This rather incredible looking building behind me is the Peña Palace in the Sintra area of Portugal, a little bit west of Lisbon. It's so fantastic looking, it's kind of hard to tell whether it's real or fake. Is this some sort of Disney mock-up or is it an authentic piece of history? Well, I can tell you this is for real. And it's probably easier for me to say that about this place than it is about some of the virtual places you will find on the internet. In fact, that is one of the hot topics here at the Etra conference, the internet and internet businesses. And which of those are for real? Which ones will succeed and which ones will fail? I think that the next 18 months are a war of attrition. And it's going to be a question of who has the resources to hang on. Um, We've sort of seen already the first wave, I think, of web pioneers, um, many of whom one, one can't even remember their websites because it was a whole 18 months ago, are out of business. A lot of the early city guides, for example, um, then 
it was a good idea, it was an obvious idea to do city guides. And then the next generation really came along that was things like city search and digital cities. So we're already, I think, into a second generation um, that's well-funded enough to hang on for some time. Uh, in fact, I've heard quotes from various credible venture capital sources that would actually go uh, say that as high as 90% of the companies that have been created during this internet uh, financial speculation period will, will no longer uh, be with us. Uh, already, when you look at the, the public stock market, uh, on one hand, the number of public technology companies has doubled in the last four years. Uh, that being said, of those companies that have gone public in the last four years, 75% are already trading under their IPO price. So what that means to us is that Darwinian process has already begun. The question is, of course, what does it take to succeed in the web business? And some of the thinking on this subject has done a complete 180. Do you have revenue from the real world, in other words, or are you just depending on the Internet for your money? When I look at a Barnes & Noble, selling books in the real world is a nice revenue stream. Or as if Davis, they have a wonderful print publishing revenue stream. It may be old-fashioned, but it makes money. So they have much more, I think, bandwidth to continue to do their web operations than a web-only operation. Uh, it's interesting because the early wisdom was that if you, that the winners would be the people who just did websites because they wouldn't be worried about competing with their real-world businesses. But it may turn out that having a real-world business is not a bad thing. But the Amazon.com situation raises other questions about whether any web business can survive. If you pick the great electronic commerce success story, Amazon.com, which is growing on a sales level at phenomenal rates, you know, our question is, you know, when are they ever going to make money? And when they start making money, uh, what are their margins going to look like? In the technology world, we're used to the Microsofts that make 37% uh, profit margins. Uh, in a distribution business like a Barnes & Noble or an Amazon.com, uh, really you're talking about 5% gross margins. So how that's going to translate down to the bottom line I think is a big question. The good news, or perhaps the amazing news, is that there are still hundreds of new web businesses opening up every day. And Mike Rogers thinks it's not too late to get in. If you have a really great and truly original idea, it's still probably possible, and it's going to happen, to make a fortune on the Internet. Because the Internet's so good at, with a truly great idea that has the ability to easily spread, um, to, to publicize something that is great. At the same side, there are so many people, though, coming up with the same great ideas. It's, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you hear so many business plans that uh, someone else, you've just heard the same business plan. It's like very original, really bright, and 10 other people have already thought of it. From an investor's point of view, the rules for Internet companies seem to be a world apart from the normal measures used to gauge startups. When I took uh, PowerSoft public in 93, the rule was that you couldn't go public unless you had minimum three, better four consecutive quarters of growing profitability. Uh, today, of course, uh, profitability is never mentioned almost in IPOs. It's always off in the future. Uh, today, clearly, uh, what people are buying in IPOs is they're buying promises of the future. And effectively, uh, the comment I mentioned that Bill Gurley, uh, one of the more brilliant guys in our industry, made is that what changed is that Internet companies are valued today not on how much money they make, but on how much they spend under the theory that the companies that spend the most have the best chance of getting market share, which maybe someday will turn into revenues and profits. One way to make money off the web is to be in the server business. And one of the hot product categories here at Etra was the low-cost, standalone web server for small businesses. This is the Whistle Interjet. It is an all-in-one solution to setting up a website and providing all Internet services to your employees. It includes tools to create your own website, which you can host locally or mirror to an ISP. You can easily set up user accounts, email, firewalls, intranets, etc. Setup is relatively easy, and you can have it up and running in about an hour. The cost for the Interjet is around $2,000. Another sharp-looking entry in the small web server category was the Cobalt Cube and the Cobalt Rack. 
The Cube is a microserver that sells for only $1,000. It can service a small business and handle up to 100 users. Daily traffic can be up to 140,000 email messages, 50,000 file transfers, and 250,000 web page requests. The Cube self-configures when you turn it on, but you can customize the configuration, change the IP address, and add peripherals through a PCI slot. Connection in progress. Please wait. Internet telephony was another hot topic at Etra. This is the newest version of the Aplio phone, which lets you do internet telephony without a computer. Just plug the Aplio device into a standard phone line and call anywhere, almost for free. Have you been able to see Lisbon? If the person you're calling doesn't have an Aplio device, a new version of their software will let the person you're calling receive the call on their PC using common applications like Microsoft's Outlook Express. One big topic of discussion at Etrit was the future infrastructure of the Internet. Dave House, CEO of the new Bay Nortel merger, says the world needs a new Internet. Today's web really grew out of the university research environment. It was sort of a best effort uh, kind of a service. But going forward, uh, business, to run its business on the web, needs something that's mission critical. It's of the class that we have in our telephone system. It's always up, it's always available. Well, almost always, 99.999% of the time, uh, it's up and available. And it's, it has the capacity. I mean, we can't go there and find that, I'm sorry, you can't get a, a dial tone. Or, uh, it has to be highly reliable and has to have the capacity to handle the tra peak traffic uh, whenever that happens to, uh, to be. And so uh, we need a different kind of web, one that provides differentiated service, that has high availability, mission critical uh, availability, high capacity. The problem is that not all net packets are created equal, but today's web treats them as equal. Voice communication needs to be done in milliseconds. Uh, it takes about a 30 millisecond uh, delay between our conversation before we notice it and our speech becomes very abrupt and very disjointed. Uh, same with video conference because it's real time interacting. When we're doing, when we're looking for things, we're in a second kind of, of a period of response times. So if we're sur surfing the web or we're asking for technical support or we're ordering something, uh, we talk about seconds. And then there's some things that are kind of in the minute time frame, uh, sending emails and voicemails, et cetera, file transfers, uh, are things that can happen in, in a time frame of minutes. So we really live in a, in, a, in a millisecond, second, and minute sort of categories. And yet our network handles everything the same. The answer, according to Dave Howells, is a new two-tiered internet with a sort of coach class, today's web, and a new business class internet. It basically means that as the packets flow through the network, the network elements need to be able to examine the packets and quickly identify the type of data and provide differential service. Most of the volume today is of the minute or second kind of variety. Yet the things people want to do, which are a very small part of the volume, need very high uh, uh, transport time, very short uh, latencies like voice and communication, represents a very small part of the uh, traffic on the network, but requires a differentiated kind of service. The other big internet issue here was bandwidth into the home and who is best situated to deliver it? Telephone companies, satellite systems, or cable companies? Rural Peeper believes the winner will be cable. We've looked at uh, you know, all the cost models of satellite, the uh, behavioral aspects of satellite versus telephone versus cable. Uh, also the penetration rates. If you look at the United States, how many homes have cable? Uh, AT&T's decision to buy TCI, um, and of course the basic capabilities of set-top boxes. Uh, we're one of the largest producers in the world. Um, I think the set-top box will be the one of the two uh, main player, one of the main players in the home, and we call that the control point in the home because in you know the next few years you really don't need two internet connections. You don't really need two phone connections or two. TV broadband connections, you need one. And the question is, which one is it that is going to manage that link? As to which device will manage that broadband link into the home, Peeper says that task will probably be divided among several devices. So the real issue is common standards. All the audio video PC 
the equipment you would buy, will have to cooperate together. Uh, even the most simple thing is you would want to have one remote um, and not nine. Um, and you would want your Philips TV to work with your you know, Sony DVD, the DVD player or vice versa. Um, you also would want that you can go from your PC to a broadcast session or from your TV to an internet session. And so there will be some of those interoperability issues. That's got to get resolved. And that can only be done together. Sony, Philips, Microsoft, Sun, it can, that's the only way. Um, a homogeneous solution there would be a pretty big mistake, I think. A homogeneous being one size fits all solution. I do not believe in that at all. As to which applications will be the most successful on the web, most everyone here agreed that e-commerce is, for now, the big internet winner. And one of the more interesting aspects of e-commerce is the boom in online stock trading. NASDAQ President Al Barkley says it's a great idea, but buyer beware. Well, it puts more responsibility on the individual investor who's taking advantage of these technological innovations. Uh, but overall, it will improve the market because it broadens participation. It makes access easier. NASDAQ is fundamentally an inclusive market. We invite people to come in and compete. And with this new set of rules and with our new technology, we now have the ability for the investor to compete directly on an equal basis with the market professionals that are there every day. But there are still real risks for the individual getting involved in e-trading. And one big one is e-information. Al Barkley says beware of online tips. Well, I think that people need to be very, very careful in the advice they get off the Internet. Uh, there are active, uh, malicious, uh, rumor-mongering sources of advice who are working against you. They appear to be working for you and they in fact are working against you because they have the other side of what they're recommending you to, if they're recommending you to buy, they've already bought. If they're recommending you, you to sell, they're probably short and want to drive the stock down. So you've got to be very careful about that. Finally, what about the yo-yo NASDAQ itself? Is the high-tech sector still dangerously overpriced? I think that we run a certain risk of, uh, of uh, frothiness and of speculation in this market and that I believe uh, what I have said is that sooner or later there's going to be a lot of Ferraris for sale cheap in Silicon Valley. That's it for part one of our special coverage of the ETRA conference in Lisbon. I'm Stuart Chaffe for the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by PeopleSoft a global supplier of enterprise application software for business, education, and government. PeopleSoft. We work in your world. To purchase a videotaped copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. Next week on the Computer Chronicles, part two of our special coverage of the ETRA conference in Lisbon, we'll show you the latest speech technology from...